Welcome to Geosynthetica's GeoTalk podcast, where we foster civil discussion on civil engineering, sustainability, and geosynthetics in infrastructure. I'm Chris Kelsey, Senior Editor of Geosynthetica. Geosynthetic clay liners have a tremendous record as hydraulic barriers in engineered lining and capping systems. Still, they are not necessarily well understood by the larger geotechnical design community. They require knowledge not only of geosynthetics, but of sodium bentonite types, behavior, and suitability in certain applications. Dr. Craig Benson, Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, is one of the most versed researchers in the world on GCLs and particularly regarding bentonite and bentonite polymer composites. These composite materials are changing the way we view GCLs and what they can do, especially in aggressive environments. Here's our conversation. We've seen tremendous advances in GCL technology and application use, especially in the past 10 to 15 years. You've certainly been part of a lot of the research there and that research helps us better quantify, design for and understand barrier system performance. So with all that in mind, I'd like to start with what stands out to you about the trajectory we've been on with GCLs? I think the trajectory really reflects a, a broader understanding of why GCLs function the way they do. You know, when we began using GCLs in the late 80s, early 90s, we knew they worked. We didn't necessarily understand why they worked well. We knew we'd been using bentonite for decades. It's a wonderful clay mineral, been in, used in the environmental business. But we had uh, really used it without really understanding exactly how it worked. We've used bentonite for years. And when we first developed GCLs, we really we understood that they worked. But we didn't necessarily understand why they worked or what their limitations uh, where they would work. And what's happened in the last 20 years is really fundamental advances in understanding the conditions under which bentonite functions as a very low hydraulic conductivity material and where it doesn't. Kind of what are the key mechanisms or processes that enable bentonite to form a, a nearly impermeable gel? And where are the limits to that, right? Because as an engineer, I want to know where is this going to work? and where doesn't it work so I can specify our products appropriately. And that uh, foundational material has really evolved over the last 20 years, which is both uh, includes physical phenomena, conditions of hydration or moisture availability to wet the bentonite, but, and also chemical or geochemistry conditions, which affect the, alter the ability of the bentonite to swell. And they're both important And then the last 20 years particularly in my group and others, really try, we've spent time trying to understand those processes and put them in a way that the engineer uh, can use them to specify products appropriately for particular uh, engineering applications. That's, that's the trajectory from an empirical condition where things work to an engineered system that functions in, under a well-defined set of conditions that we understand with a high degree of detail. Bentonite, of course, is quite literally at the center of it all. Done considerable work with what we're calling bentonite polymer composite GCLs. Can you say a little bit about what makes these composites different? I'd be glad to. You know, bentonite itself, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable material. Uh, and it swells from a, a dry kind of granular product that when we essentially process it from the mine into a soft gel condition, which is really almost impermeable. Uh, but that only happens under a certain set of conditions. And if those conditions aren't present, the bentonite doesn't swell and it doesn't form an impermeable gel and it can't function in the role that we expect it to as a hydraulic barrier. And we have conditions today in the engineering applications that require something that works over a much broader range of conditions. So there's, there's a limitation of where conventional bentonite will work. And when we get outside that range, we need to have essentially something else to make it effective. And the, the bentonite polymer composite materials are unique in that they actually rely on the bentonite component, like we have for, for decades, 
but they also re, uh, rely on what's called a polymer hydrogel or a soft kind of gel type material made out of polymers. Those two uh, components function together over a broad range of conditions to fill pores and control the flow of liquids in the environment. And, and, the, and the bentonite polymer composites are truly a composite. They are bentonite and polymer that work together uh, synergistically to uh, provide a low hydraulic conductivity barrier over an enormously wide range of conditions. And we specifically can engineer different composites to fit into those different conditions. It's very interesting to me how GCLs have evolved. I mean, GCLs by their nature are composite materials. To have composites designed, you know, engineered inside of composites, basically, is what's <laughs> uh, going on. They are different. Chris, maybe I'll just add a little bit. That's, that's somewhat unique about the bentonite polymer composites, because we've used polymers in industry for a long time with bentonite and drilling fluids, for example, use polymer yes. modifications. And in, a, in some GCL products and bentonite products over the years, we've used surface modifications with polymers to get, give the polymers, a, a, the bentonite, uh, use the polymer to give the bentonite a different rheology or to give it essentially a surface resilience, you might say, to chemical conditions. This, these products are very different, the bentonite polymer composites, because it truly relies on bentonite and polymer together to function. One's not altering the other, but they're actually working in tandem to provide the barrier. So, and this is barriers, for example, is what we've referred to as aggressive conditions. So what, what are aggressive conditions in terms of use of geosynthetic clay liners and the applications in which designers may encounter them? Yeah, this is a Fantastic question. In fact, I had somebody pose this question to me just, just yesterday, and they wanted to know where was that transition from normal conditions to aggressive? And it's a little blurry right now exactly where that transition is. But you know, a lot of our historical knowledge was based on, for example, on municipal solid waste systems, where those leachates, we have really understand their chemistry, and we understand the physical condition in which we apply those GCLs. Uh, and our conventional bentonites work great in those applications. They just, they're fantastic. But we now in industry are dealing with other conditions where the leachates, the geochemical conditions are much more aggressive in the context of the concentration, the pH, the alkalinity uh, of the of the liquid. So for example, one, we deal with a lot of uh, liquids in the mining industry. For example, bauxite uh, liquor or, or red mud, which is a byproduct of manufacturing aluminum, one of the metals that's ubiquitous in our world. The, li the solid liquid residual from that has uh, a pH sometimes 12 to 14, really alkaline, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a really alkaline byproduct. The liquid in that Red mud maybe have a concentration that's five to 10 times higher than what we would see in a municipal solid waste leachate. So very, very different conditions. And, and they're outside the range of conventional bentonites. And that for, in many cases, although there are some bentonites that work well, even in those extreme conditions. And that's where the bentonite polymer composites come in. It's these really extreme conditions. I use aluminum, for example, in the United States with the Coal Ash Act, which essentially changed our, all of our regulations for management of coal ash in the electric utility industry, we see leachates that are really unprecedented, uh, that we never saw before. Uh, in my laboratory, you know, we talk about things like ionic strength, which is a measure of concentration. Five molar uh, uh, ionic strength liquids, these are like syrup, right? They are so concentrated outside the range of anything we've dealt with before. And a conventional bentonite just can't hack that, right? But the bentonite polymer composites together can manage that really nicely. And we engineer it specifically to work in that chemical environment. That's also the really interesting part. <laughs> How is our understanding of chemical compatibility changing now with bentonite polymer composites, the suitability factor here? It's changing a lot. We developed our test methods, our standards around uh, a knowledge base that was really focused on understanding the physical and, and geochemical conditions in conventional bentonite, which were driven around cations or positively charged ions in solution and swelling of the bentonite. 
uh, and we had a lot of experience in that and developed essentially a set of empirical rules which we could use in the laboratory which would enable us to run tests and evaluate whether we really had captured an equilibrium state. Well, all that's changing with these new materials because they function differently. Uh, when we have, uh, for example, I mentioned with bentonites, we focused a lot on, on the cations in solution, uh, the positively charged ions, because they interacted with uh, the bentonite surface. Well, one of the things that we found with polymers is the other ions play a really important role, the anions. So now we have to keep track of both the positives and the negatives in solution in a way we didn't before because the anions are just as important as the cations when we look at these bentonite polymer composite materials, a new paradigm of thinking about the geochemistry. The other thing is that's really different about these materials is the, pol the polymers that we rely on, they're gels. They're uh, almost like a, a gooey jelly substance. And, and they're, not a, they're, they're a solid, but they're mobile they can actually move in the pore space. And for uh, these products to work very well, we can't have very much of that polymer elute or essentially flow out of the, of the GCL. That's become a major issue. How do we evaluate that potential for elution, as we call it? And how do we have test apparatus that allow us to uh, evaluate that properly and don't give us a false positive or a false negative? And that's, that's an evolving area uh, and we're going to see new standards development coming out in the next couple of years as a result of that. I think that's interesting because the expanding use of GCLs ultimately seems to be one of those engineering areas in which you can witness how the state of the art becomes state of practice. Can you share a few of the practical lessons we can derive from all of these technical insights and changes in how GCLs are thought of in the field? Yeah, one of the things that, you know, we've talked a lot here today just about kind of all these mechanisms and chemistry and things like that. But ultimately, what matters is being able to specify a product for an application as an engineer that you have confidence is going to work. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the state of practice part that we we're, we're want to get to. We will talk about different mechanisms and processes. In the end, the whole end, end point is to get at essentially rules and lessons learned that engineers can take with them so they can select, specify, understand conditions, select products, and specify them for an application. So, for example, you know, this issue of what's aggressive? Well, where we'd like to be able to get to and where we're pretty close to right now is being able to say, well, you know, I'm dealing with a electric utility and I, their leachate has these characteristics. When I have these, see these characteristics, I pick this class of products because I know they work. I don't have to wonder about, well, they might work. Let's give it a try. I know they work. I can specify in that range. I can set up a testing protocol to do the validation steps for quality control and compliance and go to that, to that endpoint for specification and use, essentially taking it out of an experiment to practice. And I think that that's that's one of the areas is, is where we're transitioning from state of the art to state of the practice is how do we allow an engineer to look at the conditions that, that they're facing and pick a product with confidence based on the information we have. That's in, that's engineering practice as opposed to research and development. You know, the other things that we're seeing are really important in these products is about pol polymer loading. How much polymer do you need to have in there? You know, we, we study this stuff in minutia in the research laboratory, and it, we love it. You know, it's just fascinating. But in the end, what the engineer needs to know is what, what's the percentage got to be? What's the minimum? It's got to be 5.5%. And where is that? How much uncertainty is in it? And how does the engineer write a specification that says, okay, I'm getting this product delivered to my job site. How do I validate that the vendor provided me what they said they did, right? That's, what, that's where the engineering hits the ground, right? And that's the practice part. Well, how do, how do we tell people that? And, you know, one of the things we've done is actually develop very clear methods by which people can measure those properties, write a specification, and apply it. And that really came out of years of experimentation and development. 
Yeah, I think the other part too, kind of the practice part is the evolution of what you asked about earlier is chemical compatibility testing, which has always been part of our portfolio. But how, what are the things that as an engineer, I need to make sure my laboratory has the capabilities to do so that they give me an outcome that I can count on? Because in the end, when I'm the engineer of record, I sign off, I am responsible. I need to know that my specifications were solid, my laboratory were solid, what, is, what do I need to know in my knowledge portfolio as an engineer about what that laboratory's got to be able to do, right? And, and do they know the things to look for when testing these materials? Because we do know, depending on how you run the test, you can get a false positive or a false negative. You can get exactly the opposite answer that you think you're, that you should get for those conditions. And so we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Craig, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and uh, sharing your time today. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. A few years ago, Dr. Benson led a series of four webinars on GCLs and aggressive environments, use of polymer modified materials, case studies. This was supported by the University of Virginia, which supplied PDH credit, and Solmax, which now hosts the series on demand on its YouTube channel. We'll provide the links to this series and an article on Geosynthetico. Visit geosynthetico.com slash podcast. I want to congratulate Craig on his retirement from UVA and the Professor Emeritus Status Honor in Madison, which has a tremendous civil engineering school and where Craig spent many years. That's all for this week. If you missed last week's wonderful interview between co-host Tamara Tuttle and CEO Jean-Louis Vangeluve, catch up on GeoTalk with iTunes, Spotify, and on Geosynthetica's YouTube channel. Until next week, keep learning and keep sharing your stories from the field. Thank you for listening.